Okay, so the next chapter that we're going to jump into is chapter 24, which is all about carbohydrates. If you're in the more recent edition of the Klein textbook, we're going to skip chapter 23, which is about organometallic chemistry. And carbohydrates, I think, are really fascinating. In fact, that's what I did my first research on. And carbohydrates are typically made through the following reaction, which you might be familiar with from some of your biology courses. If you have carbon dioxide, and you have some water around, you can use a series of enzymes along with some sunlight to directly make these carbohydrates. And the most famous carbohydrate that you typically see in your biology classes is D-glucose. And D-glucose, if we look at it, can be shown in an open or closed chain form. And we'll talk more about that here in a second but it has a number of different stereocenters on it. And so typically we represent D-glucose like this. So even though we can show D-glucose using bond line notation, oftentimes what we do instead is we tend to show carbohydrates using Fischer projections. So let's go ahead and draw these out and I'll do a few example ones. So the first example carbohydrate that I have that I'm gonna draw in the Fischer projection form going to look like this. It's going to have three horizontal crossbars. It's going to have an alcohol group at the end. It's going to have an OH group coming off the right-hand side in every single position, and hydrogens off the left-hand side. So this is one main class of carbohydrates, and the way I quickly identify these is by the top group. You see how this top group is an aldehyde? Because it's an aldehyde, this class of carbohydrates is called an aldose. Okay, there's another type of carbohydrate that you might run into though, that looks a little bit different. So let's go ahead and draw this out. And same idea, it's got three crossbars. It still has this alcohol group on the end. It still has an OH group here and hydrogens on the left. And in this case, if we look at this top group, it's no longer an aldehyde, but rather a ketone. And because it's a ketone, we refer to these as ketoses. All right, so these are the two main classes of carbohydrates that we're gonna run into. So let's just make a note here. So two main classes of carbohydrates. And if you open up your textbook, you'll see tables of these. In fact, you'll see a whole family tree of the aldoses and a whole family tree of the ketoses, where really what we're doing is we're changing these stereocenters right here, right? So maybe the OHs are on the right, or maybe they're on the left, or maybe we have more carbons or fewer carbons. The one interesting thing that you might notice, though, is that regardless of the carbohydrate, this bottom OH group is always to the right, at least for natural sugars. And these are called D sugars. So all D sugars have specific stereochemistry at that position. So all D sugars have the lowest alcohol group on the right. That's important to remember. Um, we have, as chemists, made some artificial sugars where we've changed those OH groups to the other side. One cool thing is we've done this with glucose. So we've actually made L-glucose where the OH group is on the other side. It still tastes like sugar, but it has zero calories, which is kind of cool. The problem with it, and the reason we don't see it in Coke and Pepsi, things like that, is it costs about $100 a gram to make. So all natural sugars have it on the right. We can make L sugars. They're just not found um, in nature, really. All right, there's one other thing I wanted to quickly talk about, and that is how we can further define these. So in this case, let's focus on this molecule over here, right? We've got one, two, three, four, five carbons in our backbone, right? So we can further describe this as an aldopentose. So the pent indicates that it's a five carbon backbone for this carbohydrate. And the aldo indicates that it's an aldehyde coming off the very top. So this would be an aldopentose. We could do the same thing over here, but now we need to include the carbon on the ketone. 
So we go one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that this would be a keto. Whoops, sorry, this should be a six, not a five. This would be a keto hexose, meaning it has a ketone off the top, but now it's got six carbons making it up. And if you go into that table, you can actually look up the specific names of these carbohydrates. I'm not gonna expect you to memorize them, but it is interesting to see the names. So for example, the aldopentose that I have shown on the left is called D-ribose. And again, the D just indicates that this OH group is coming off the right-hand side. And if we go and we look for the keto hexose that I have on the right within our table, you'll see that this is called D psychose. And it always is represented um, with six carbons and the exact stereochemistry coming off of carbons three and four where the OHs are off to the right. All right, so you might be wondering, there's a lot of different stereoisomers. Uh, do I need to memorize the names of all of these carbohydrates? No, absolutely not. Um, if you go on and take biochemistry, you're going to study this in more detail. All right, so let's quickly go back and review Fisher projections, because I know some people might be rusty on this. Okay. And the main thing to remember with Fisher projections is that any horizontal crossbar is going to be assumed to be wedges. Anything that's not a horizontal crossbar, meaning a vertical crossbar, is going to be an assumed dash. So let's go ahead and take the D-ribose that I had above, and we'll convert this into a drawing using dashes and wedges. So we've got three carbons in the backbone. And if you want to show all of them as dashes, you can do that. We've got an aldehyde coming off the top. We've got this alcohol coming off the bottom. But what I like to do is this bow tie drawing. So show all of these horizontal crossbars as like little bow ties coming off. And we'll make sure that they're nice, clean wedges. So you've got OHs here, here, here and then hydrogens on the left. So let's go ahead and try to find the uh, stereochemistry for one of these. So for example, this carbon right here is a stereo center, right? We wanna first determine the highest priority. So we could go ahead and we could say, well, oxygen is the heaviest attached atom to that carbon. So obviously that's gonna be priority one. Hydrogen is gonna be priority four because that's the lightest. But if we go out, right, we've got a carbon here and we've got a carbon here that's attached. So we've got a carbon-carbon tie. That means we need to do the tiebreakers. So let's focus on the top carbon. That top carbon is bonded to the oxygen and the aldehyde, right? And it's bonded twice, right, through a double bond. So we count that twice. We count one of those oxygens as a ghost oxygen. That's for the double bond. And then it's also got the hydrogen on the aldehyde. The lower carbon is bonded to an oxygen, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So it is important to remember when you do this, you want to look at going out further, not back closer to your stereo center, right? So when we look at this, it seems quite clear that the top position is going to be a higher priority than the lower position. So this would be priority two. This would be priority three. So we can go ahead, connect one, two, three, kind of ignore number four for right now. And we're going counterclockwise or to the left. Normally that's an S, right? But because this hydrogen is a wedge, we need to flip it, right? So in this case, this top, top stereo center is going to be an R. So make sure to slow down when you're working on these and follow the tiebreaker rules if you're ever stuck. It's really easy to get kind of um, going too fast and make simple mistakes and not assign the correct stereochemistry. All right, so a lot of students will look at this and they'll say, all right, normally in my biology classes, they don't show aldehydes as carbohydrates. They show the, the ring form of carbohydrates. So let's briefly review how the ring form is made. So what I want to really focus on is the fact that these are aldehydes. They're just present in really small amounts in equilibrium. Usually what we see 
is the ring closed form. So why does that occur? Well, if you have an aldehyde like this, where you've got some, let's just say R groups coming off um, these positions, we're just gonna ignore those R groups for right now and focus on the aldehyde that I have drawn. If you have an aldehyde like this, and you've got some sort of catalytic acid around, you can imagine that the first thing we're gonna do is protonate that CO double bond. So now we've got a protonated aldehyde. It's gonna be really electrophilic, and this alcohol can add in and kick up electrons. And the reason this happens is we go from one, two, three, four, five, six. So we'd make a six carbon ring. So let's go ahead and draw this. So we're gonna make a six carbon, or sorry, six atom ring, not six carbon ring. And one of those atoms is gonna be oxygen. So let's go ahead and number this. We'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. If we think about carbon one, or sorry, not, I keep on saying carbon, atom one hits oxygen. It still has a hydrogen on there, giving it a positive charge. Carbons two, three, four, and five are kind of plain. They just have two hydrogens. And then over at carbon six, we're going to have an OH group and an H group, right? And this carbon is kind of unique, right? So let's highlight this carbon right here because we formed a new stereocenter. So let's go ahead and mark that up and just say formed a new stereocenter. This is called the anomeric carbon. Another way of thinking about this is this is the carbon the anomeric carbon, that was that CO carbon, right? And because we can attack from the top face or bottom face, we could get either R or S stereochemistry at this new stereo center. And then last but not least, we can deprotonate. Let me change my colors here. And we can get to our ring-closed carbohydrate. Now, students will often ask me, okay, you're showing this in equilibrium. How much of it is going to be the ring closed versus ring open formed. Well, usually a very small portion is gonna be in that open chain form. Most of it is gonna be in this closed chain form, but it is an equilibrium. So we have to think about carbohydrates as acting like aldehydes too, or at least for uh, aldoses. Um, so we need to keep that in mind that they can do traditional aldehyde chemistry for aldoses and traditional ketone chemistry for ketoses. Uh, the other thing to remember is once we've made this, this is a special functional group. This is a hemiacetal. It's had one equivalent of an alcohol add-in, but not the second one. It's happy staying in this hemiacetal form. All right, so let's focus in on um, that anomeric carbon for a little bit. And I wanna do this by looking at glucose, the most famous molecule or most famous carbohydrate, I should say. I don't wanna be biased here. And glucose is a classic aldose, but it's got four crossbars. And it's got a CH2OH, and because it's a D sugar, this lower OH is gonna to be to the right. Next highest one's gonna be on the right. Next highest one's on the left. And last one's on the right. And then the rest of them will just fill in as hydrogens. So it is D-glucose, right? It's D-glucose because this is hanging off the right. And let's just label this. And this is definitely an aldehyde, so we're gonna call this an aldose, giving it the aldo prefix. How many carbons are in here? Well, six, so this would be an aldohexose. And if we treat glucose with catalytic acid, just like you saw in your pod earlier this term, it can ring close. So if you need to, go back and look at that pod where we actually ring close glucose. You went ahead and did that mechanism. And because I'm an organic chemist and not a biologist, I really prefer drawing chair forms. So the chair forms that we drew for glucose kind of looked like this. And one option was to have this going down
And the interesting thing to think about is this carbon right here is the anomeric carbon, right? It's the carbon from the aldehyde. So now the question is, well, where is it in our final product? Well, in this case, what it is, is it's going to be this position right here. So this is also the anomeric carbon. And we can create glucose two different ways. So let's go ahead and draw the other way. Oop, sorry, my drawings aren't as clean as I'd like, but you get the idea. You see how the only stereo center that I've changed is this one. All of the other positions are in the exact same position they were in, but now we flip this one up. So this is still anomeric. All right, so then the question is, well, how do we describe the difference between these? These are clearly diastereomers, right? So carbohydrate chemists will look at this and they'll say, well, this is pointed down, right? So this is axial. And because it's axial, what we're going to do is we're going to call this alpha. So when they look at this molecule on the left for D-glucose in the ring closed form, they'll call this alpha D-glucose. And the alpha just refers to that anomeric OH group being pointed in the axial position. If we look at the other one, it's kind of sticking out equatorial. And because it's equatorial, what they're going to do is call this the beta position. So this would be beta D glucose. It still uses the exact same chemistry that we showed above where we formed a new stereocenter, center, and because we formed a new stereocenter, it could be either R or S or axial or equatorial, giving you these two diastereomers. In particular, what we call these are anomers because they vary exclusively at that anomeric position. All right, the way that you typically see these drawn though is a little bit different in your uh, biology textbooks. And what they tend to use is something called a Haworth projection. It's not my favorite way to show carbohydrates, but it is something I think we should focus on just so we know what we're looking at in our biology textbooks. So let's take our chair form of glucose, and I'm just gonna pick on beta D glucose. Okay, so this is our classic chair form. We're used to this with cyclohexanes, right? Let me even clean this up a little bit more. And we, in first term organic chemistry, we did chair flips, all that good stuff. In this case, this is the most stable chair form because it has the most groups in the equatorial position, right? So this is gonna be quite stable. In addition, we said that this is our anomeric carbon. And if we want to, we can even go in and we can start drawing in the assumed hydrogens. So we've got an assumed hydrogen there, there, there. We also have one in the back here kind of pointed down and one there pointed down. So all of these hydrogens are assumed to be axial, right? So we haven't drawn them in, but we know that they're there. All right, the Haworth projection looks a little bit different. It's more like a flattened out chair. So imagine that you're looking at almost a planar cyclohexane. So we're just squeezing this flat. We're not really seeing that zigzag anymore. And what we do is we could go ahead and we could say, well, the anomeric carbon is going to be one, two, three, four, five, and then the oxygen is going to be number six. So let's just go ahead and do this the same on our Haworth projection. So I'll go ahead and say one, two, three, four, five, and then oxygen is six. So let's go ahead and fill these in. So off of carbon one, if I'm looking down on this, right, the OH group should be sticking up towards my eyeball. So let's do the same thing here. If it's sticking up towards my eyeball, it's definitely gotta be here. And then the assumed hydrogen would be sticking down. Now let's go to carbon two. 
If we look at carbon-2, well, now the hydrogen is closer to our eyeball, so that should be sticking up. And the OH group would be down. And let's go to carbon-3. Carbon-3, the closest thing to our eyeball, would be this OH group, so that should be sticking up. And we can go ahead and fill it out like this. Then carbon-4, the OH, or sorry, the hydrogen is sticking up, not the OH group, so we can go ahead put that hydrogen up, OH group down. And then carbon five is kind of the trickier one. It's got the CH2 OH group sticking up. So we'll go ahead and draw that like this. And we'll draw the hydrogen down like that. So this would be the Haworth projection. The main thing to remember is the anomeric carbon is that carbon right next door to the oxygen. That's the former aldehyde carbon position. So this is still going to be the anomeric position. Let me clean this up. So this is the form you typically see in textbooks. Um, I do want you to know how to interconvert back and forth to each of these, but it is pretty easy when you use that um, eye trick where you imagine looking up or down a chair. All right, before we finish up, I know this is a longer video, I want to do definitions. And really quickly, we said that alpha, if you ever see that, means that the OH coming off the anomeric carbon is axial. So we talked about that briefly. So if you ever see alpha in the name, that's referring to that position of that anomeric OH group. Beta is a little bit different. We said that that means that the OH group coming off, oops, not of, the anomeric carbon is equatorial. And then if you think about the terms we've been throwing around, anomers are diastereomers that differ only at the anomeric carbon. So alpha versus beta, they're considered anomers of one another. And it's important to know that they're differing only at that one position, not any other position, all right? This is different than an epimer. An epimer is a diastereomer that differs at only one stereocenter that's not the anomeric position. However, it is not the anomeric position. So an epimer, an anomer is a type of epimer, but it's more specific. An epimer is basically something where any of the other stereocenters are flipped, but only one of them is flipped. So make sure you pay attention to the one here. Um, a lot of times students get confused with this. All right. And then the next one, it's called muto rotation. And what muto rotation is, is it's the ability to flip from ring closed to ring open, and through that, convert from alpha to beta. So thereby flipping from alpha to beta. So you can actually flip anomers. So even if we have D-glucose, like we saw 
up here and we've got a bottle of alpha D glucose if we put it in an acidic solution in equilibrium we will eventually get some of the beta D glucose because it will ring open and there's a probability that when it ring closes back up it could form that beta anomer all right so muta rotation will show up the last two terms show up a lot in biochemistry so i wanted to briefly talk about those first one is pyranose this is furanos. And if we think about pyranose, that's a six membered ring with oxygen. We haven't really seen that prefix pyran very often, but we have seen furan, right? And that was the five membered ring with oxygen that was aromatic, so it had double bonds in it. So this is going to be our five-membered ring version. And sometimes you will see ring-closed versions of these carbohydrates that instead of being a six-membered ring are called, or they're five-membered rings, and these are called furanoses. All right, so I did um, want to briefly cover these definitions because they show up a lot, especially if you take biochemistry. But what we'll do for the remaining portion of the chapter is we'll delve into the chemistry behind these carbohydrates.